Welcome back, everybody, to Crit and Crit. I'm Sint. And I'm Axiom. And we are continuing our playthrough of Pokemon Christmas as Axiom backtracks and goes right back to where we came. Yeah, I thought the character might have, the NPC there might have some new dialogue. And we are continuing our discussion of A Christmas Carol. Yep, so last time we mostly focused on just the sheer depth of the pop cultural osmosis that the story A Christmas Carol has had on Western culture. Like, I do not know how a single person could actually get through a December these days and not have at least minimal exposure to it or be able to reference something from it. Like, we use Scrooge as a fairly common illusion even outside of the Dickens work, even if it's only through the Disney character, uh, Scrooge McDuck, who was obviously named after him and portrayed him in the uh, Disney version of the uh, of the story. So today, um, we we're go going to just focus on the bare bones breaking down of the actual plot of the novel itself. And you just were in here. Yeah, I didn't know this dude gave me uh, It's time around. for a magic car. Yeah, I might do some fishing. Or does this hack we catch something else? I don't remember, and we will find out off screen because I don't want to see her catching magic carps while ever while we're discussing everything. Also, yeah. So it could be a good way to fish for compliments, though. <sighs> anyway, what? So for the two people in our audience who have not uh, grown up with Christmas Carol being a constant part of their lives, we are going to give a basic run-through of the plotline as it goes. Yep, and it actually, it's kind of curious because I um, had never read it until we actually decided to do this episode. So I did not know that it actually started just straight up talking about ghosts and death. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Like, that's a good start to a holiday story if I ever heard one. Like, I would not have expected that knowing what I do today. So, it actually spends, like, a full page and change talking about Marley's death and how he had no friends except Scrooge before Christmas even gets mentioned. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yep. So basically we just go through that. Um, Christmas Day comes and, well, Christmas Eve comes. It shows Scrooge being a cantankerous old jerk to everybody, which is apparently normal because Scrooge doesn't like people or being around people and he just wants to be left alone with his money and so on and so forth. He finds Christmas an inconvenience. He looks down on people who celebrate it because he doesn't understand how all of these people with so little to their name can actually afford to enjoy a day of, as he sees it, basically just idle screwing around. And then he's still expected to pay his sole employee for not coming in on Christmas. And feels as though he's being robbed in the process. He tells a couple of charity workers to um, go away um, very, very bluntly, which we'll get into more later. Um, he tells his nephew he has no interest in Christmas. Um, his nephew actually kind of tries to call him on this nonsense. It's like, well, you're saying that you're not coming by because I got married, but you didn't come by before then, so that's not really the reason. Well, I'm going to keep trying, and you're still welcome to come by. You're not, you don't have any argument with me, and I'm not going to let you get the better of me, Uncle Scrooge. Y you know, a morning person, so you can kind of see where Scrooge has a point to be annoyed with him a little bit here and there. But, yeah, so Scrooge basically resolves to spend Christmas alone because he doesn't care. Cratchit goes home to spend Christmas with his family because Cratchit cares. So, you know, our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. So, Scrooge does eventually head off to his home, and this is where oh, the... Gosh. Yep. This is where the book once again emphasizes that you remember all of the effort they put into reminding you that Marley was dead, because, as the book says, nothing that happens now... Oh, for the love of Pete. Oh, if we catch that relic, we should name it. We should name it Katy Perry because it used roar. No. Yeah, we already have a fire type anyway. Uh, to remind you that nothing will that happens will seem particularly special if you don't remember that Marley is dead. 
mean, I don't know. The fact that they call attention to the fact that Scrooge sees Marley's face in the door knocker for a split second and then it goes back to normal seems kind of out of the ordinary to me. And, uh, I don't care if there's someone alive or dead whose face suddenly appears in my door knocker. I would be equally concerned if I saw a phantom face in my door knocker of, like, Barack Obama as I would Abraham Lincoln. That's still not a face that belongs in my door knocker if it's not normally there. I mean, why wouldn't you have an Abraham Lincoln door knocker? You could use his beard as the knocker. Because that's tacky. That's tacky, Axion. We have some class here. That's fair. So anyway, the door knocker taking the appearance of Scrooge's dead former business partner is only the beginning of the strange things that happen for, for the night at his home. Scrooge lives a Spartan lifestyle, one that requires him to spend as little money as possible. He uses small candles, heats almost none of his house except for a single fireplace, leaving the entire rest of a very large building in mostly darkness, and subsists on gruel and other simple fare that he doesn't have to spend much on and rents out what little space he has to spare, and currently he has no tenants, so there's no one else in the building, and yet- Well, actually, it mentions that the rooms are let out as offices, so right. no one's- Oh, well, no one's there because um, it's Christmas, and everybody who's not Scrooge is going to spend time with their loved ones. Because, like, we can't actually say that Scrooge doesn't have any because he, his loved one just basically said, Hey, you want to come to dinner, Uncle? And Scrooge said, No. Maybe we can get a go in. Yeah, I don't know what all exists in this hack, so I'll take your word for it. Ralt's feeling. Speaking of feelings, uh, Scrooge very quickly feels fear when Marley shows up. You know, we can just call him Marley. Okay. Oh, were you gonna name him present? Yeah. But Marley works too. Actually, no, let's save Marley for a ghost type. Okay. So we have past and present for Faulkner. Alright. And we end and we have the Nidorans, which we didn't name. Yeah, <laughs> Good job. they're just placeholders. Okay. So, basically, Marley shows up, um, basically, Scrooge says, Hey, you're not real. I don't trust my senses because, literally, I could have indigestion and be hallucinating right now. And Marley's like, Bruh, I am come from beyond the grave to try and save you from the fate I'm experiencing. Can you please take this seriously for five minutes? Which Scrooge eventually, you know, he finally gets through to him. He's like, okay, yeah, you see this chain? It's because I was a selfish, greedy jerk in life, and now I am basically cursed to wander the earth, looking at all the people I failed to help now that I have lost the ability to do anything about their suffering. And Wait. Scrooge is like... The best part of it is how Marley gets it through to him. He sits there and lectures Scrooge for a while, and Scrooge basically gives him the answers that he knows Marley wants to get Marley to leave him alone. And then Marley basically says he has to leave. He gets up and he draws Scrooge towards the window, and when Scrooge gets to the window, he looks out and sees all these ghosts out in the streets uh, and and wandering through the sky and meandering through the crowds of the last few people to get home with their packages and stuff for the night, and how these spirits are all miserable that they have to be forced to watch the goings on of the living world. These are annoying. I'm going to do them off screen. Uh, but be. They have to watch the goings-on of the living people and in the world, and they can do nothing to interact with them. Yep, and even better, um, the air was full of phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste, moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge. 
Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human manners and had lost the power forever. So clearly the message Dickens is sending there very, very obviously is, well, at, the, at, at the, its base, human nature is good and wants to help people. It can be blinded temporarily, but the immortal soul, uh, so to speak, it will come th when there's no mortal ties left to uh, distract them, they will still want to help people, but now you can't, and this is your hell. Yep. And rather than, and in the opposite to people who say things like hell is other people, hell for these spirits is being surrounded by people that they can have no interaction with, that they can have no conversation with, that they know are there, and people are completely oblivious of them, and knowing that they did this to themselves. They ignored these people in life, and now these people will be unaware of them for all eternity. Yep. So, anyway, Scourge will be visited by three spirits, one coming each night in succession. So, he tells him, Nothing else other than just when to expect them, and then Marley leaves. He is not permitted to stay for very long. So, Scrooge is basically left alone with his thoughts and his terrors until the next t until the next bell, which obviously he assumes he has slept through the next day, tries to prove that he hasn't, and then we have the ghost of Christmas past arriving to basically just walk Scrooge through his own past, which... I do like how the ghost is described, but let's save that for when we actually go into each of the spirits in detail. We're just doing plot recap today. So, yep. Ghost of Christmas Past goes to Scrooge being taken home from a miserable, lonely boarding school on Christmas by his sister, who happens to be his nephew, uh, nephew's mother. Which makes me wonder if that's a reason he's been avoiding uh, Freddy, is because, well, he reminds her too much of his dead sister, who he loved and who was not very healthy. Um, then fast forwards to Scrooge as a young man, an apprentice at Fezziwigs, and just a very fun party had there for one Christmas night and how fondly he remembers it. Then it skips ahead a few more years to uh, Scrooge um, having an argument with Belle, his, um, at that point, fiancé, who is breaking, breaking things off with him because, well... They've grown apart, and Scrooge uh, has decided he cares more about money than having a relationship. Yep. And Belle doesn't think that she could... Belle has, thinks that she has not changed, Scrooge has, they are no longer compatible, and she's going to free him from this obligation and go find someone else. Which, as the ghost of Christmas past also shows Scrooge, she does because the last scene he sees is her husband coming home to her and all of their children and mentioning, I saw your old friend Scrooge. He he looked uh, miserable, like all alone in the world. I think his partner's on death's door. And Scrooge just wanted to see no more of it. Because you could, yeah, you can tell that like, yeah, this had an impact. Scrooge has been blocking out quite a bit of his past because, you know, memory is a nice thing when you don't remember the painful parts, isn't it? Yep. So then... The next day, the next bit, Scrooge once again thinks that he's slept through an entire day when the next, uh, when the next, uh, bell goes off for the clock, and he's basically put himself on guard, expecting the spirit, the next spirit to appear, and he... And basically nothing happens until he lets his guard down, and then suddenly, big booming voice telling him that the next spirit is here. The spirit is the ghost of Christmas present. Who... Yeah, which, that one's fun, because he actually leaves the room to, to go looking and see, like, yeah, I'm just going to see how this goes. Goes back into his room, and, yep, the ghost of Christmas spirit has summoned a gigantic feast. Which I think Dickens might have just wanted to describe a lot of food. Because, yeah. I mean... He clearly had a lot of fun writing this. 
It's up there with Redwall in terms of describing food. I think I may have underestimated Faulkner. You know the meme of the bird that says it was a calculated risk? Man, am I bad at math? Here's hoping Sam attacks enough to keep me alive. So anyway, Ghost of Christmas present. That's smokescreen. Same difference. Yes, the yeah, the Ghost of Christmas present is a is uh, there to take Scrooge through other people's presents because obviously Scrooge's Christmas present is screaming at a ghost in his bedroom because probably would not be very good at convincing most people to develop something resembling Christmas spirit. So first place he takes him is to the Cratchits. So we get a pretty good descriptor of how modest all the celebration for the Cratchit family is because obviously um, Cratchit is not paid very well at his job. I wonder why. Scrooge. Uh, and just everything to do with that, but he can still see how happy they all are, but the thing that really gets to Scrooge is Tiny Tim. And the fact that the child is very clearly not doing well, and probably going to die according to the Ghost of Christmas uh, presents, if things are not changed. So, Scrooge starts to work, and starts to have his eyes a little bit open to that, and then ends up going to uh, Freddy's Christmas, where everybody there, like, mentioned, uh, Scrooge has talked about it a fair bit, most people glad he's not there, but Freddy's just like, oh, he's not that bad, and Scrooge kind of ends up becoming kind of the butt of the joke on a few occasions, but it's, Freddy, at least, never means it means spiritedly, and Scrooge kind of gets swept up in the games they're playing, even if he's not actually physically there. So, which kind of leaves things on a pretty good note until the Ghost of Christmas present reveals the two spirit children that have come with him. Ignorance and want. Which immediately brings things back down to being real for Scrooge again. He asks about what can be done about them, um, which we'll go into more later when we actually talk about the Ghost of Christmas presents visits in its own section. And, uh, well, we leave Scrooge once again on a very thoughtful and somber note as we move on to um, him waking back up and getting the third visit. Spiro does not look happy to be here. Spiro is never happy to be here. But yes, the Ghost of Christmas Future. I don't think there has been a single version of Christmas Carol that has been ever done in any medium that does not portray the Ghost of Christmas Future as the most terrifying thing ever. And we, again, we will get to this in more detail when we get to the specific section on the Ghost of Christmas Future. But it's almost always described in some horrifying, grim reaverish way. And then you, if you listen closely, the Pratchett fans can hear a simple question. Can you tell me again how the little horse-shaped ones move? Yeah, sorry, the Grim Reaper thing just doesn't have the same terror if you are a fan of Discworld to death, like we are. Yep. And don't worry, we will get into plenty of Discworld on this show in the long run. Do not fear. But getting back to the subject at hand... The Ghost of Christmas Pre Future takes Scrooge through some future time, at which point he discovers Tiny Tim has died, Someone has liquidated all of his assets, and he himself is also dead. At which point he wakes up, it is Christmas morning, and there is much rejoicing. Yay. Yep, because that means he hasn't lost three days, there's still time to try and fix things and make things right with the people he has more or less wronged. So he first checks that it is actually Christmas Day, is told yes, buys the big goose in the butcher's window, and sends it anonymously to the Cratchits, uh, uh, makes a donation to that charity he had kind of um, told exactly what they could do with their charity earlier, and then goes to spend Christmas with Freddy. Which uh, kind of breaks Freddy for a second, because I, I kind of get the impression if you ask a relative for like, every single year for years if they would like to come to Christmas and they say no and then they suddenly show up, you're going to be a little confused, yeah. So, but yeah, it's it shows a lot of growth for Scrooge and all it took was uh, being 
haunted like crazy for a night to uh, convince that, you know, maybe you should care about Christmas. Yeah, I'm not sure you're getting this badge. Well, we'll find out. Yeah, Faulkner's a little tougher than I'm used to. Well, you also waited until, like, right before you fought him to catch any team and didn't grind them up at all. Well, like, I, I mean, know they're placeholders, but... I mean, I wasn't expecting to need to. I was expecting to just steamroll over Faulkner like I always do when I play some Gen 2. Because <laughs> his team is usually, you know, very low level. If you're gonna do that, you usually want to grab a Geodude from Dark Cave, and I'm not sure this hack has that. Uh, I think so, considering that a guy offered to trade me... might want to go with Lear. Actually, yeah, that might be better. Um, uh, offered to trade me a Pikachu if I could get them a Geodude. Both of those things would be helping you a lot more right now than what you've currently got. Yeah. Thankfully, I have potions. At least we didn't go with Chikorita, huh? That'd be hard, man. Yeah, yeah, it would be. Stop using Quick Attack. But at least it's not using Mud Slap. But yeah, it basically Scrooge go Scrooge starts off as a jerk, gets scared into behaving, and is a changed man by the end of the story. So, character development is always a good thing, right? Usually. Unless it's of course the kind of character development where you end up worse than you were in the beginning. But I mean, that... it would still make for an interesting story, but I'm not really sure how you do that given how Dickens set Scrooge up. Also true. Oh, the beeping. I'm glad I splurged some on potions. <laughs> yep. Also, yes, buying my victory. So terrible. I mean, we are talking about Scrooge. This is true. It actually makes me wonder, like, since we kind of learned that Scrooge set aside, basically saved all this money, I'm guessing probably because he wanted to have a good life with Belle, but he never spent any of it even after she left him and he no longer had any reason to save all that money. At that point, it kind of implies that Scrooge was saving for the sake of saving. He was being miserly because money was meant to be hoarded in his mind, not to be spent. Which, of course, is a terrible mindset, but it's also one that's... And that's why he ended up alone and bit with one very persistent family member trying to get him to come out of the show a little bit. Yay, badge get! I am actually kind of surprised that I pulled that off, but I did have to use every so single one of my potions to do it. So, take that for what it's worth. Yep. This seems like it's going to be a good place to stop. So, until next time, this has been Crit and Crit. I'm Sint. And I'm Axiom. And we will see you next time for a more in-depth uh, analysis of part of A Christmas Carol. Bye-bye! Goodbye!